So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for being here this evening and welcome to uh, tonight's webinar, the CMP Corridor, Bad for Maine's Forest and Wildlife. I hope that you and your family are safe and healthy during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic that we're all still living through. Um, we would love to be with you in person this evening, but we appreciate you uh, adjusting with us uh, and being with us tonight uh, on Zoom. My name is Todd Martin. I'm the Grassroots Outreach Coordinator at the Natural Resources Council of Maine. NRCM is a nonprofit membership organization protecting, restoring, and conserving Maine's environment now and for the future. For more than 60 years, the Natural Resources Council of Maine has been protecting the places and the way of life that make Maine so special. NRCM harnesses the power of the law, science, and the voices of more than 25,000 supporters all across Maine and beyond. Uh, our office is in Augusta, just steps from the State House. Um, before we get started with tonight's program, just a couple of tips um, and um, FAQs about the, the technology that we're using this evening on Zoom. Um, so first thing, this webinar is being recorded and you'll receive an email from me tomorrow afternoon with a link to watch the recording on YouTube, uh, which we encourage you to share with your friends. Um, uh, your video and your audio is disabled uh, for tonight's program by design. You'll only be able to see and hear our, uh, our five presenters. Um, if you have a question for any of our panelists, please type it in the Q&A box, which you can find in the ribbon um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It's a little Q&A um, with a chat box next to it. Uh, so type your questions in that Q&A box, and we'll have plenty of time uh, for questions at the end of our program. Um, so before I turn it over to our panelists, uh, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Sue Ely, who's NRCM's Climate and Clean Energy Staff Attorney, to discuss the many ways that NRCM uh, continues to fight uh, the, the CMP corridor, despite the fact uh, that the referendum will not appear on the November 3rd ballot uh, due to the Maine Supreme Court's decision uh, last week. Uh, but the fight goes on, and Sue Ely is here to uh, tell, us, uh, tell us how. So Sue, take it away. Thanks, Todd. Um, yeah, so we are all disappointed in the Supreme Court decision, uh, and we think that they came out on the wrong side of the issue. Um, but luckily, the fight is far from over, and there are a number of things that we're doing and that you can do to continue to fight this um, incredibly destructive project. So um, <clears throat> just a little bit about what we're continuing to do. Um, we uh, have challenged the Department of Environmental Protection's permit. Um, that challenge is pending. Um, we've appealed the decision to the Board of Environmental Protection um, and uh, a number of other groups have joined uh, with us in that appeal. And so that is ongoing. Um, we also are active in a lawsuit that's challenging the validity of CMP's lease uh, to cross public reserve lands. Um, that is also pending. Uh, we have um, we have very strong reasons to believe that they um, they really made a big mistake um, in not getting uh, a legislative vote for permission to cross public reserve land and have um, challenged the leases on those grounds. Um, we also are continuing to watchdog the Army Corps of Engineers process for evaluating the environmental effects of this project. Um, and this is a place where we can use your help. Um, and if you haven't already, uh, it would be a great thing for you to do. Um, and Todd's gonna send an email follow up afterwards with some details around this. But um, anybody who hasn't already can contact the Army Corps of Engineers and ask that they do a full environmental impact statement. That's an EIS. Um, on this project, and that is a, um, a, full, a fuller environmental review than what they've done so far on the significant um, environmental and cultural and social and economic impacts of this project on um, our main environment. Um, uh, we have received a, a lot of help. Um, Congressman Golden, um, just recently sent a letter to the Corps asking them to do a full environmental impact statement. So if you live in his district, another action that you can take is to send him a letter uh, thanking him for his action and reinforcing that this really is not what the people of Maine want. So if you, if you live in the congressman's district, please 
send him, drop him an email, phone call, a text to say thank you. Um, if you, uh, if you want to take even further action, um, we also need folks to reach out to um, Senator, our senators, Senator King and Collins um, and Representative Pingree, and ask them to follow Congressman Golden's lead and also request an environmental impact statement from the Army Corps. Um, so those are just a couple of the things that you can do to help us in this fight, but um, please take heart that there are so many different avenues to fight this project um, and that there are still many, many ways uh, to fight it and there's a lot of fight left. So um, I hope that you enjoy the presentation today and our panelists, um, but uh, keep on keeping on. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thanks, Sue. Uh, I get to be the leadoff hitter here. Uh, I'm Dave Publicover. I'm a senior staff scientist with the Appalachian Mountain Club. Uh, I've been there uh, nearly 28 years. I'm a forest ecologist. And for much of that time, I've been involved in issues related to energy facility siting, uh, originally mostly wind power, uh, but more recently, uh, transmission lines and solar. And I have been a uh, a, uh, an expert witness in both the Northern Pass uh, project and the, uh, the uh, New England Clean Energy Connect. So next. So just a brief background on this. Uh, you've probably uh, all seen this or know about it, but the project would be a 145 mile long high voltage direct current transmission line uh, to bring Hydro-Quebec power into the Southern New England market. Uh, primarily in response to a, a clean energy request for proposals from the state of Massachusetts. Uh, it includes 53 miles of new corridor, which is the upper part in, in orange, coming in uh, across the Canadian border at the headwaters of the Moose River in Beatty Township, west of Jackman, uh, connecting across uh, to a uh, existing corridor uh, in the Forks, and then uh, heading south, uh, expanding uh, the existing corridor down to Lewiston. So next, please. <clears throat> so this is a, uh, an example of, uh, not an example, but a map of the new corridor. Again, comes in uh, west of Jackman, uh, heads east south of the Addian Ponds region and north of Spencer Pond. Uh, it turns uh, south to head over the northern shoulder of Coburn Mountain, uh, heads back east to cross Route 201, uh, a nationally designated scenic byway, uh, crossing the state's Cold Stream property and a couple of other properties, and turning south, uh, crossing uh, the Kennebec River. Originally, it was going to be an above ground crossing, but when CMP realized they probably could not get that permitted, they agreed to bury it under the gorge. Uh, <clears throat> And then again, uh, connecting to existing corridors at the northern end of Moxie Pond. Now, those of us who have the fortune of being able to uh, live, work, or play in the North Main woods may somewhat take it for granted. Uh, it doesn't quite have the cachet of the big wilderness areas of the Adirondacks and the White Mountains, uh, except for Baxter State Park. Uh, we realize that most of it is commercial working forest land. It's full of logging roads. There's a lot of harvesting those, that goes on. Uh, but that should not diminish how truly special it really is. Uh, so next slide. <clears throat> the Western Maine Mountains, to put it simply, is the heart of a globally significant forest region that is notable for its lack of permanent development and fragmentation and high level of ecological connectivity. And if you look at any measure of human impact on the landscape, whether it's population density, uh, public roads, or the presence of uh, developed and agricultural land, the North Main Woods is really a big blank spot on the map. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it truly stands out uh, in the Eastern United States. If, if you imagine a scale of human impact starting with big wilderness on one end and downtown Manhattan on the other. The North Main Woods is pretty close to the wilderness end of the scale. Really the, the only uh, 
major impacts are logging roads and timber harvesting. Uh, but despite that, it has not been converted to uh, you know, large scale plantations like the southeastern United States pine forest. It retains a relatively natural forest composition. And it's one of the few places in the eastern United States that can still support the full range of uh, native wildlife species. Uh, next, please. You can also see this on a map of nighttime lighting in the United States. Uh, again, you can see the extensive networks of cities, towns, roads in the eastern United States. And you can see that big dark spot up in the uh, upper right hand corner of the map. That's the north, north woods of Maine. So next slide, please. <clears throat> And this has been recognized in a wide range of documents and analyses and including some from uh, Maine state agencies. Uh, the Land Use Planning Commission's comprehensive land use plans recognizes that the forests of the jurisdiction, which are the 10 million, the jurisdiction is the 10 million acres of Maine that is unincorporated territory. They are part of the largest contiguous block of undeveloped forest land east of the Mississippi. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, the plan also says remoteness and the relative absence of development in large parts of the jurisdiction are perhaps its most distinctive feature due to their increasing rarity in the northeastern United States. Uh, they recognize that this is a special and different type of uh, landscape. <clears throat> Next slide. The state's uh, uh, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife State Wildlife Action Plan also states that Northern Maine is unique as the largest area of undeveloped natural land in the Eastern United States. Uh, critically important uh, for a right, wide variety of reasons, recreation, uh, timber economy, but especially for the habitat it provides for species, uh, especially those that needs large areas to maintain viable populations. And next slide. <clears throat> And a report done by Janet McMahon, who's one of the state's uh, most respected ecologists, uh, states that the Western Ma 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 Mountains region lies at the heart of the Acadian forest, the largest and most intact of temperate forest in North America and perhaps the world. Uh, next slide. Uh, we can see this in a study that was done by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, the areas in green represent the temperate broadleaf and mixed forest ecoregion, which are parts of the world that are uh, temperate, uh, not northern, not tropical. They have a seasonal climate, they have a mixture of uh, evergreen and broadleaf trees. <clears throat> and they occupy uh, primarily the eastern United States, much of Europe between the Mediterranean and the more northern boreal area, and eastern Asia, Ch China and Japan. These are some of the most heavily populated and heavily settled parts of the world. Uh, this biome is quite amenable to human civilization and has been for a long time. It has abundant rainfall, has abundant resources in terms of uh, uh, food, in terms of, uh, in terms of wood, in terms of water, uh, <clears throat> reasonably good agricultural soils. So it, this, uh, this area has been a, you know, this biome has been a focus for human settlement for, for 10,000 years. Next. <clears throat> this shows what's left uh, in terms of large, relatively undeveloped blocks. And you can see that the largest area is that big blob of yellow in the north, uh, far northeastern part of the United States, encompassing the North Maine woods and parts of maritime Canada. Next. Uh, the Nature Conservancy has also done a, a very widely respected and used analysis uh, used for conservation planning called the, the Resilient and Connected Landscapes Analysis. It identifies those areas that are best suited uh, to allow species to adapt to uh, a changing climate. And one component of it is local connectedness, which is a measure of fragmentation. Uh, it measures how well species can move across the landscape uh, given the presence of barriers such as roads and development. And again, you can see the, you can see the Adirondack stand out, uh, the long corridor from uh, the White Mountains of New Hampshire up through Northern Maine uh, and extending into parts of Maritime Canada. Uh, next. The National Audubon Society has recognized the value of the North Maine woods 
by designating uh, the region as the largest globally significant important bird area in the country uh, in recognition of the fact that it is able to support the full suite of native bird species. Next. Another regional initiative called the Staying Connected Initiative, which is uh, working to maintain the habitat connectivity across the region uh, and, and maintaining that ability for species to move across the landscape. It includes environmental organizations, number of state agencies, including uh, Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and Department of Transportation, and the area extending from Northeastern uh, Vermont up through uh, the Western Maine Mountains is recognized as one of their priority linkages, areas that are particularly important for maintaining habitat uh, connectivity at the large scale. Uh, next. <clears throat> so what happens when you put a transmission line <clears throat> or a transmission corridor through uh, this type of landscape? Uh, this is a picture of an existing line in the Northeastern Kingdom of Vermont. It's 150 feet wide, the same size as uh, the NECEC corridor would be. Uh, you can see how different it is from the surrounding landscape, even, even given uh, the, the timber harvesting that has taken place, uh, and significantly wider than uh, the road that is passing through that area. And what types of effects does this create? Uh, for one, it creates ed edge effects. Uh, when you expose uh, the edge of a, uh, a forest area, it allows increased penetration of light and wind uh, and invasive species into the adjacent forest zone, creating an area of what's called edge habitat. Uh, and these effects, depending on the, you know, the orientation and the particular effect, can extend for several hundred feet into the adjacent forest. Uh, it changes that habitat uh, and makes it into a, a more transitional habitat. With that comes the loss of interior forest habitat which is forest area that is, has a relatively continuous canopy uh, and which is removed from edges. Uh, and there are numbers of species uh, that prefer or require interior forest habitat. They don't like edges, they don't like young forest, uh, they like more continuous uh, mature forest away from the impact uh, of edges. And the edge zone and the area where uh, existing or potential interior forest habitat can be lost can be, can be larger, uh, three to four times larger than the actual area cleared for the corridor. And it also creates an impediment uh, to species movement. Uh, this is not the Great Wall of China, it's not an absolute barrier, and many species will not be impacted. Deer, moose, bear, uh, many other types of species that are perfectly comfortable using open or young forest habitats will have no problem crossing it. Uh, the issue is with uh, species that require interior or mature forest uh, and don't like the exposure of open areas. Uh, the most notable uh, example uh, is American Martin, uh, but also it includes numbers of salamanders. Uh, and this, uh, creating a corridor such as this, uh, essentially separates populations on one side or the other. It doesn't mean that Martin won't cross it, but they may expend a lot of energy moving along the edge of the corridor trying to find uh, a pathway through it. Now, CMP in their application has continually characterized this landscape as you know, heavily intensively managed industrial forest and essentially comparing the corridor to just another large clear cut. Essentially, they're saying the landscape is already trashed, so what's, what's the big deal? Well, the corridor is not the same as timber management for a number of reasons. Uh, for one thing, it creates permanent early successional habitat rather than the shifting mosaic of patches of the different ages and sizes uh, that exist from timber harvesting. Uh, it, it's an extended linear feature that will extend across the entire width of the Western Maine Mountains region. Uh, Martin can go around a clear cut. Uh, they can't go around this. They have to cross it and they don't like to do that. <clears throat> and it's also wider than even the largest logging roads. Uh, the primary logging road through this, through this region is the, uh, the Spencer Road. And if you look on Google Earth, you can see that the width of the, the sort of cleared corridor from one edge of the forest to the other across the road is at most 60 feet. 
uh, this would be two and a half times wider than that. So again, for species that don't like crossing open areas, this becomes a much wider barrier. Next slide. So this is part of the area through which it will pass. Uh, this is an area south of the Adian Ponds and number five bog. For those of you familiar with the area, Whipple Pond is there. Uh, the Spencer Road is coming in from the right hand side and bends down uh, towards the bottom. And you can see again that this is uh, this is a mosaic of a, a mosaic landscape. There's evidence of timber harvesting throughout it. You can see partially harvested patterns where there's skid trails, uh, particularly south of Whipple Pond. You can see some areas that are regenerating clear cuts of different sizes. Uh, some of the open areas around the open water are wetlands. Uh, but again, uh, <clears throat> something like an American Martin uh, will be able to travel through this landscape. They may have to meander their way from you know, more mature forests, but they're really no, the most significant barrier to their movement is the Spencer Road. Uh, next slide. So this is what it looked like when you put the corridor through it. Uh, again, just creating a barrier across the region, uh, a continuous, long, wide stretch of young and open forest habitat uh, that is <clears throat> both quantitatively and qualitatively different than the surrounding mosaic of, of forest stands. <clears throat> next slide. <clears throat> Now, one thing that was a major issue in, in the permitting was the fact that CMP completely failed to assess uh, less damaging alternatives uh, to the project. Uh, the permitting requires them to, uh, to consider alternative routes and the two alternatives that they considered were completely impractical by their own admission. They probably could not secure those routes and they were uh, certainly would be more damaging. One of them came down through the McGalloway River and Rangeley Lakes region. The other one came down through the through the Bigelow and Flagstaff region. But these are two of the other competing projects that were, were uh, bid into the Massachusetts Clean Energy RFP. Uh, one of them is from Vermont, the, the Clean Power Link. Uh, this project would uh, much of it would uh, be underwater down Lake Champlain with the remainder uh, heading east-west across southern Vermont, would be completely buried along uh, highways and railroads. Again, no uh, above ground, no new corridor. Uh, this project has been fully permitted with very little opposition or, or concern about impacts. Uh, unfortunately, it was also the most expensive uh, of the three projects that were bid in. Uh, they chose to do it right, and they suffered for it. Uh, next, we have Northern Pass uh, down through New Hampshire. This project had a lot of problems. Uh, we fought it tooth and nail for eight years and eventually won. Uh, shows the, the benefits of persistence. But Northern Pass realized that they could not get permitted uh, to expand their existing above ground corridor through the White Mountain National Forest. So they agreed to bury 60 miles of it underground along state and local roads uh, in conditions that would be that were far more difficult uh, than what CMP might have faced if they tried to bury theirs. Uh, again, this one was uh, somewhat, somewhat less expensive than the Vermont project. And then you have NECEC, a completely above ground uh, project until they agreed to bury a short stretch under the Kennebec Gorge. But most of it will be above, the rest will be above ground, 53 miles of new corridor. And you can see that is uh, significantly cheaper uh, than the other two projects. Uh, they chose to uh, propose a higher impact, lower cost project. Uh, now Massachusetts originally chose Northern Pass. Uh, <clears throat> Even though it was more expensive, uh, we think that is probably has a lot to do with the political influence that Eversource had uh, on the bidding process. But when it was rejected by uh, the New Hampshire permitting authorities, uh, Massachusetts chose NECEC as its, uh, as its uh, second choice. And while Massachusetts has a, uh, a reputation for being an environmental leader in a lot of ways. They really dropped the ball on this. Uh, 
by looking primarily at cost and, and giving very little consideration to the fact that they were exporting the damaging impacts of their clean energy goals to other states. Uh, and we really have to uh, uh, strongly criticize them for that. And I believe that's the end of what I have. Uh, next slide, I believe that's the end of my presentation. Uh, so Jeff, uh, you're up if you want to take yourself off mute there. There, now folks can hear me. Um, so my name is Jeff Reardon. I, I work for Trout Unlimited. Um, uh, I'm going to give you the uh, aquatic perspective, uh, and in particular, the perspective for brook trout. I work for Trout Unlimited. We're a conservation group whose mission is to conserve, protect, and restore North America's trout and salmon fisheries and their watersheds. Um, and for us, I'll just say, and I'll, I'll, I'll show some reasons for this, but this portion of Western Maine um, is the most significant wild trout resource anywhere in the East. Um, and it is comparable with the wild trout resources that lots of people travel to Montana, Idaho, uh, Wyoming, even Alaska for. Uh, it's an intact resource, um, uh, very much on par with, with any other cold water resource that exists in the world. And it's, it's been a, a destination fishery a place people traveled to fish uh, since the mid 1800s. Um, Dave said, and I think he's right about this with respect to, to lots of recreational uses that the Western Maine Mountains does not have the cachet of the Adirondacks or the White Mountains, but among, among anglers in particular, it does. This, is, this has been a place that people have gone and spent money to hire guides and go fishing for a very long time. Next slide. Um, so I, I grew up here in Maine. Uh, I started fishing the Western Maine Mountains region in the mid-1980s uh, and have been fishing it ever since. I now live in the Augusta area and um, this is the, you know, this is the closest really good wild trout fishery to my house. I spend um, days and in some seasons weeks in the region every year. I, I know it very well. Um, this is similar to some of the slides that, that Dave showed that compared um, terrestrial impacts uh, in, in, uh, in northern Maine to what's present in the states around us. In this case, we're looking at uh, a measure of aquatic habitat degradation. Uh, and the scale that you're looking at uh, runs from pink, which is the least degraded habitat, to bright red, which is the most degraded. Um, and you can see that um, with the exception of Maine and a little corner of, of Vermont and a little corner of New Hampshire, uh, habitat in the pink category is extremely rare. Uh, it's quite common in Maine, and in fact, the entire Maine border with Quebec um, is is in that um, in that undegraded condition. This is uh, looking at, at some of the same measures of fragmentation that Dave looked at, but for for water, what really matters here is things like dams, culverts that block fish passage, um, hard development that creates impervious surfaces like rooftops and parking lots, and as those of you who know the region know, uh, Western Maine does not have many of those. Uh, and in particular, the region west of Route 201 doesn't have much. Next slide. Um, you see that reflected in the quality of the brook trout populations. Uh, in 2006, there was an assessment done that looked at the um, uh, uh, status of populations and threats to populations in a region that ran from Maine south to Georgia, which is the native range for brook trout in the US. Uh, and uh, there, I've just pulled a couple of quotes out of their report here. Uh, Maine was identified as the last true stronghold for brook trout in the Eastern US. Um, Maine has as many intact sub watersheds as all other states combined. There were a total of 17 states in this assessment. So take every other state from New Hampshire to Georgia uh, Maine's got more intact brook trout habitat than all those states combined do. And you can see that reflected in the map here where what's shown in the two shades of green is intact habitat. And we are especially rich in pretty much every place other than Maine. Our brook trout populations are only in headwater, relatively small streams. Maine is the only place that has significant portions of that resource in lakes and ponds. 
and 97% of the remaining wild lake and pond populations are here in Maine, and they're heavily clustered towards the region through which the NEC will pass. Next. I want to talk about some of the impacts, and I think that the way I would generally characterize the impacts of this project, um, uh, Dave, I think, had it right in terms of this will be the only big feature that crosses this landscape. Um, to put that in context, if you look at this on, on Google Earth um, and you start at Moosehead Lake and you look west to the Canadian border, uh, you only cross two paved roads going from, from Greenville to the Canadian border. Um, this NECEC corridor will be longer than either of those two roads and about three times as wide as they are. Um, and instead of running north-south, like those roads mostly do, uh, down in the river valleys, it will run up and down east-west over the tops of all the ridges. And from an aquatic perspective, what, what that gives you is what I call the death of 10,000 cuts. It's not just that this will cross some of the kind of important named trout resources that I spend my time on, like the Moose River and, and uh, Enchanted Stream and the Cold Stream and the Kennebec Gorge, but it will also cross every other little finger tributary along the way. So here we're looking at a section where the NECEC would cross the south branch of the Moose River um, out in, I think this is just south of Beatty Township. Um, there will be 18 stream crossings, and what I'm showing here is about a mile of the NECEC. So there's 53 miles of greenfield like this that, you know, within each mile has um, anywhere from 10 to, in some cases, as many as 20 crossings uh, per mile. There are 300 plus total stream crossings of brook trout bearing waters um, in segment one. And if you add up all of those little 150 foot slices, because that's the width of the corridor, it totals over 11 miles of stream. And that's not my number, that's CMP's number. That's what they put in their application. Next, please. Um, another example of this, just again, think about the death of 10,000 cuts. Also think about the, the value of good planning and the um, harm of the absence of it. Uh, Peel Brook is a very significant brook trout tributary. It is the spawning tributary to a lake called Parlin Lake. Um, when it, the stream crosses it well up in its headwaters. And, you know, you could have designed this so that you had one crossing of Peel Brook and limited that impact to, to a single 150-foot crossing. Instead, just by the route they chose, I don't know why, they end up crossing it twice in less than a mile. So they jump from one side of the brook to the other, and then they jump back again. Um, frankly, they could have avoided both of those crossings and gone through with much less impact on it. And this is just an example, but if you look cumulatively at their stream crossings, you see those kinds of features over and over again. They're trying to build a straight line across resources that are, are curved and complex, and that results in multiple impacts in, in many places. The other thing is to, to look at is not just how many crossings are there, but how often is that corridor very close to the stream. We talk a lot about the importance of the first 100 feet between the stream um, and, and, and the uplands uh, and keeping that intact. The crossings violate that, but then the rest of the forest outside of that also contributes to the cold water and, and groundwater and refill and, and recharge and other things that are important to brook trout. And the fragmentation in the near stream area has impacts on that. And in this case, the line runs for, for more than a mile and never gets farther from the brook than 800 feet. Next. Um, I talked about Maine's brook trout pond resource a little bit earlier. Um, Maine has designated those subject to a public law that was passed, if I remember right, in 2006 or 2007. We have a, something called state heritage fish waters, which are um, brook trout for the most part and also Arctic char um, populations that are in, it's a lake or pond that contains a wild population of brook trout that has either never been stocked or it may have been stocked historically, but not in at least 25 years, which would be five generations of brook trout. If they're still hanging on after that, we're, we're not looking at what's left from the hatchery. We're looking at a wild intact population. There are about, uh, there are about uh, 575, 580 of these ponds designated in Maine. Um, the NECEC will cross close enough and close enough here was within about half a mile that I think it's gonna have impacts on seven of those as it passes through this 53 miles in Western Maine. And the example here 
um, shows Rock and Iron Pond. Rock Pond has been a destination fishery. I started hearing about Rock Pond when I was about six years old. I've, I've fished it many times. Um, they're going to cross, uh, I believe, uh, 800 feet. Um, right behind was the most popular campsite on Rock Pond. Um, and similar impacts on a number of other ponds that are to the west and east of what we're showing here. Next slide, please. Uh, Sue talked a little bit in her introduction about the public lands impact and about um, NRCM's challenge of the public lands lease. This is an issue near and dear to my heart. Uh, on behalf of Trout Unlimited and working with the Trust for Public Land, I spent about five years of my professional life working to conserve the 8,000 acre Coldstream Forest. Um, it is the first and, and only conservation project in Maine that was specifically designed to protect brook trout habitat. And we set out with the goal of protecting Cold Stream literally from its source at Cold Stream Pond to its mouth on the Kennebec River. Uh, we succeeded in protecting all of that corridor except for a very narrow strip along what's known as the Capitol Road, which is a major logging road just to the east of um, Route 201. Um, and uh, unbeknownst to us, while we were negotiating to help the state buy that land, the state was negotiating with CMP to run the NECEC corridor through that 400 foot gap. Uh, 100 feet of that is the Capitol Road and they, the NECEC took the other 300 and literally ran right up to the border of, of the Cold Stream parcel. If you see the long skinny parcel along the left side of the map with a big red line crossing it, um, that, that is the NECEC crossing where it goes across Cold Stream. To add insult to injury, they then ran it to the west and make a 90 degree turn, or sorry, to the east, uh, to the right, make a 90 degree turn and head south, and they go across two other parcels of land that the state of Maine has owned for a long time. We specifically designed our project to abut those to get some um, benefits out of um, you know, protecting both, both sets of parcels. Uh, those parcels are the watershed for Tom Hegan Stream, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is the most important tributary to Cold Stream, which was our goal to protect. Uh, I will say I, I, number one, was involved working with BPL very closely on land conservation in this region from about 2011 up through the present. Uh, and I was asked to serve on their advisory committee that wrote the management plan for all of the public lands that you're looking at here, plus others to the north and south. And at no time did BPL engage the public or even those of us on their selected advisory committee in what do we think about the NECEC, what do we think the impacts on public lands will be, and, and those impacts are going to be significant. Next slide. Uh, this is zooming in on that crossing of Cold Stream. Uh, you see it, I'm sorry, sorry my color has changed, changed here. The, the, green, the red line is still the center line. Uh, the yellow shaded area is the cleared corridor. Dark blue here are streams that are being crossed and the green, the, the bright green, green blocks are the two cold stream parcels. And you can see how the NECEC corridor has been shoehorned in. Uh, its impacts, uh, one of their justifications is, well, this is already screwed up because of the Capitol Road. Um, but what they do is take the impact of the Capitol Road and then they put something that is three times wider and stick it right next door. So we, we go from one impact to four times as much impact in this crossing. Um, and as we go downstream to other areas they worked on, things get a little bit worse. So the next slide. Um, after the parcel heads south across the Johnson Mountain lot and the West Forks lot, um, I think this is probably from a brook trout perspective where the impact is worse at a single site. Um, they cross Tom Hegan stream. And I wanna just give a little bit of background here. Um, we have a very good, very robust brook trout um, radio tag study. That slide in the lower right, uh, the photo there, you can see somebody, he's actually inserting a radio tag into an adult brook trout. Those trout were caught in the Kennebec River, and the reason we were putting tags in them is we wanted to see two things. Where do they go in the summer when the Kennebec gets too warm for them, and where do they go in the fall to spawn? And the answer is they go into Cold Stream and they go into Tom Hegan Stream, which is why we spent so much time, effort, and $8 million of public money to protect that corridor. Um, and a very large proportion of the fish that come out of the Kennebec up Cold Stream will then go up a tributary to Cold Stream called Tom Hegan Stream. Um, 
and where the NECEC crosses Tom Hegan stream, they could have picked a place to just cross the stream once and minimize their impact, but they're crossing it in an area where it's braided through a big wetland complex and there are nine stream crossings in 1200 feet of linear corridor. So it's not just one crossing with 150 feet cleared, it's nine with all the impacts on temperature, loss of shade, removing vegetation that that will imply. And that's just upstream of the section of stream that those radio tagged fish were swimming up to spawn into. So the impacts on, on an area about a quarter mile downstream are gonna be quite significant. Next slide. And just this is my last slide, uh, an, an issue to think about. We, we did not emphasize this much in our comments, but if you looked at the map that Dave started us with, there is an eastern branch of this. I do not understand what purpose it serves. You'll have to ask an electrical systems engineer what that is. But they are also doing some upgrades on what used to be the power lines that ran from Maine Yankee up along the Sheepscot River and ended at a big substation in Windsor. Um, and what I want you to think about is, is, is look at this, this slide. I used to work on the Sheepscot River before I worked for TU. And I want you to think about the idea of what happens once a single corridor has been constructed. Because once that one power line was built from Maine Yankee up along the Sheepscot, what we saw happen between, I think Maine Yankee was built in the, in the early 70s. Um, and by the time I was working in the watershed in the mid 1990s, it, it, it had become the route along which two more power lines followed it, one on one side of it, one on the other. And then when Maritimes Northeast built a gas pipeline through that part of coastal Maine, the Maritimes Northeast gas pipeline came in here too. Now what CMP is proposing to do is to go in and, and frankly, if you look at this aerial photo, uh, the NECEC is in um, red, the cleared area is in yellow. Um, all of the other cleared area you see there, somebody may say a lot of that's farm fields, but the vast majority of it is underneath power lines or the Maritimes Northeast gas pipeline. Once this one corridor is built, we will see additional corridors be built that either connect to it or run parallel to it. And in fact, CMP is building a 150 foot wide corridor, but they've acquired the property rights for a 300 foot wide corridor. And we, you can I bet your bottom dollar, they've got plans for that other 150 feet. And we will see a proposal to develop that at which point the argument will be, well, there's already a power line that does this. These impacts are relatively minor because they're just adding to the impacts we did back in 2020. And I think that's all I've got. Hi everyone. So my name is Chloe Rouse and uh, thanks again for joining us today and continuing to be part of this fight. It's not over yet. Um, so Dave gave you this great overview of the impact on the main woods and then Jeff just gave you that aquatic picture. And I'm going to share some uh, personal experience related to the impact of this corridor. Um, next slide. I'm a native Mainer. Appalachian Trail through hiker, registered Maine guide, and the founder and director of a small Maine-based nonprofit. So we run summer camp here for girls in Maine, and my career and my life are really dependent on the health and beauty of Maine's environment. Maine's economy needs more young people to live, start businesses, and join the workforce here. And Maine's outdoor recreation economy is huge. So the Outdoor Industry Association estimates that 76,000 direct jobs are generated by the outdoor industry, along with 2.2 billion in wages and salaries, 8.2 billion in consumer spending, and 548 million in state and local tax revenue. So it's a huge draw. But population growth and the attractiveness of Maine really depend on how well we protect and promote what defines us, our environment and the unique natural beauty of our state. Our tourism industry depends on it, and really the health of every Mainer depends on it. I know now more than ever, for myself personally, and I can imagine for many of you as well, the Maine outdoors has been invaluable during this pandemic. And it's for all these reasons that I'm strongly opposed to CMP's proposed transmission line cutting through this western part of Maine. Uh, next slide. So I was born and raised here. My sisters and I grew up hiking and swimming in the lakes and mountains of, the west, of Western Maine. 
And we developed this appreciation for the clean water and quiet mountain tops and this just peaceful, pristine serenity that is so abundant in the nature around us here. And as Dave mentioned, I think we took this for granted and probably a lot of us do. Uh, but this changed for me personally about two years ago when I through hiked the Appalachian Trail. So I walked 2,191 miles alone from Georgia to Maine, my home. And uh, along the way, I, I half hiked, half slid through this like winter wonderland in the Great Smoky Mountains. And I walked alongside these wild ponies in the Grayson Highlands. And I witnessed spring arrive in a matter of two very distinct days in the Shenandoah National Park. The entire Appalachian Trail is pretty spectacular. Uh, but that being said, nothing compares to Maine. Next. So after almost four months of hiking through 13 states, I was so excited to finally reach Maine. It was pretty amazing to me how different it felt, even just crossing that border. And almost all through hikers of the Appalachian Trail will tell you the same thing, that unlike the other 13 states that the AT travels through, Maine has this kind of rugged, untouched beauty that you just do not see anywhere else, not even in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. It has this like authentic, wild feel. Yeah, it's, uh, it's Maine's wilderness is truly special. And next. <laughs> Take a second to look at these roots. <laughs> so this rugged terrain was a real treat. It's uh, Maine's wilderness is rough and unforgiving, but the views and plants and animals and this sense of just serene nature and really complete isolation from man-made interference makes it all worth it. Next. Uh, so the AT in Maine near the proposed transmission line, it's not really for those seeking a leisurely walk in the park. Um, in other states, you might get to a rock face and the trail will loop around it in a very civil way in order to avoid like hands and feet scrambling. But in Maine, you go straight up that rock face, as you can see in this picture. And that's a constant characteristic throughout Maine. It's, it's wild. <laughs> and the water here is so pure in places and the natural springs just so abundant that many hikers even ditch their water filters and enjoy straight from the ground. Um, Unlike the other 13 states on the Appalachian Trail, Maine is pretty cool in that it has both views from up high on the mountaintops, but then also views from down low alongside the lakes. And these views are unparalleled. It's just this like pure wilderness without a sign of human existence. And as I can imagine, many of you have experienced firsthand, Maine has some of the most untouched wild beauty in our country. Next. So my journey along the AT was pretty incredible, but I also saw firsthand the impact of these power transmission lines. And I walked under them and I heard the buzzing of high voltage. I really can't forget these images. They're still clear in my mind. And I could see how they cut through the landscape and the mountain ranges ahead. And I saw, I saw how they disrupted wildlife habitat and scenic character. It was a complete contrast to this wild, pure and awe-inspiring outdoors that I had grown up with in Maine. Next. So this image here is a, um, the red line is the Appalachian Trail as it goes along near Caratunk and um, sort of on the right third of the uh, map you can see Bald Mountain and then Pleasant Pond sort of in the middle. And then between those two is Moxie Pond, and that's right about where the uh, corridor would cross over the AT. And this part of Maine that um, it would cut through is not wasteland, as CMP marketing suggests. It's really some of the most beautiful forest wetlands on the entire East Coast, and I know this from experience. So I question, <laughs> why should Mainers, who value the beauty and importance of our natural environment, allow Hydro-Quebec and CMP to clear cut 3,500 acres through our forests, to disrupt 263 wetland habitats and 115 trout streams, to undermine one of the most spectacular rivers in the country, and to crisscross the Appalachian Trail three times in our state 
in order to build high voltage transmission, transmission lines that transport unclean hydropower from Canada to Massachusetts. Next. Um, you can see this view here. This is from the top of Bald Mountain near, near Moxie Pond, right where the transmission line would cross the AT near Karatunk. Um, this is what I just showed in the previous one. And this is one of the finest views in the region. And the feeling I keep coming back to in all of this is that we're being bought and it's not worth it. And when I ask what Maine gets out of all of this, all I hear about is money. And so I want you all to pause for just a moment and think. Would you give up what defines you, your values, your family, and what you believe in for money? Mainers are not like that. We're not blind and we cannot be bought. Our wilderness is valuable resource and Maine needs to entice more young people like me to come here and to stay here. And our unique natural environment can do that, but we have to protect it now more than ever. I want to be clear that I'm an environmentalist. I know we need to take immediate action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that aggravate climate change. But CMP's transmission line is not the solution. As several organizations and experts have pointed out, there's been zero reliable evidence presented that CMP's corridor will actually reduce emissions. So is it really worth all of the damage that it will create? We can do so much better. Next. And uh, I saw this quote a while back, and I just keep returning to it when thinking about this fight. I can take a second to read it. So I live and work here because I love Maine. And like many people, my career and my life are rooted in the health of the Maine outdoors. And we must defend what all of us love about Maine, and we can't afford to lose it. Because once it's gone, it's gone. And to destroy what Mainers are so proud of, all for a project that has not been proven will reduce greenhouse gas emissions and in reality will jeopardize new renewable energy projects would be a profound loss to Maine. And no amount of money can change that. Thanks. Excellent. Well, thanks uh, so much to our, our panelists this evening, Dave and Sue and, and Jeff and, and Chloe. Um, you all have been uh, in the trenches on this fight for, um, for many months and um, sometimes uh, longer than that as well. So um, thank you for, for fighting this fight and for continuing to fight this fight because it's, it's certainly not over, even though this won't be on the ballot this November. So, um, so we do have uh, time for some questions. We're running a little bit over, but I think our panelists uh, will be able to stay on a little bit past 7 p.m. So again, if you have questions for any of our panelists, please uh, type them in the Q&A box at the bottom. And I'm going to start with this uh, with first question. Um, let's see here. Um, so Jeff, I'm going to pitch a question over to you. Um, it's a question about, um, had heard that CMP had agreed to uh, reduce the width of its corridor from 150 feet down to 54 feet uh, because of the DEP permit, but um, but uh, we're still very concerned about the impacts uh, that that would have. Can you can you speak to um, uh, to that issue? Yeah, so I I, I, I think the way I, I characterize that change, and there 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 were, there were several other changes that they made um, as as essentially conditions that DEP required. Um, and I think uh, the way I characterized them to, to somebody who asked me about them was, well, they've put some lipstick on the pig, um, but it's still just a pig. And then they put another layer of lipstick on top of the first layer of lipstick, but it's still just lipstick. From an aquatic biology point of view, my biggest concern here is that we're losing buffers at all of those stream crossings. Um, oh, it looks like you, I can't put my video up now. Um, I, tried, I tried earlier and it didn't come up. Um, so I don't know when, if people can see me or not, but the biggest concern is these, the clear corridors. And if you look at what CMP will actually allow to grow in those areas, they are no longer counting as cleared. It will essentially amount to scrub shrub vegetation. We'll see some alders, we'll see some striped maple, we'll see trees with a maximum height of 35 feet. But as soon as any tree looks like it might have the potential to grow taller than 35 feet, 
they'll cut it off and they're not going to top it. They're going to cut it off at the base. That's what their, what their maintenance plan says. So are you going to see mature sugar maples in there? No. Mature spruce trees? No. Mature firs? No. Mature cedars? No. All the kinds of wood that I want to see on the bank of a trout stream to provide shade, grow insects, put food in the water, fall down and create trout pools still won't be there. From an aquatic perspective, it doesn't add anything. Dave probably has some thoughts on the impacts for some of the wildlife species, but, but uh, I suspect it's similar. We're not going to get back what we're losing. We're going to get back, um, you know, a bunch of short spindly trees that get cut down every 15 years. Yeah, when, you, when anybody tries to tell you the quarter width has been uh, reduced to 54 feet, don't believe it. Uh, essentially, originally the entire corridor was going to be maintained as scrub shrub vegetation, you know, 10 to 15 feet high, and anything taller that, than that would be cut down, uh, with a few exceptions uh, where, they, where they were going to maintain taller vegetation. But now they're going to essentially have tapered vegetation. The middle 54 feet under the lines will be maintained as no more than 10 feet high. Then you're going to have a narrow zone where the vegetation will be 15 feet high, and then you'll have a narrow zone where it will be 25 feet high, and then it'll be a narrow zone along the edge of the forest where it'll be 35 feet high, called tapered vegetation. And it may have some limited benefit in reducing edge effects, but it has very little benefit for, you know, allowing things like Martin to cross it. Uh, and in many places, if, if if the quarter goes through an area that is an even age 40 foot high stand, that whole thing is going to have to be cleared. It's going to be cut down and then that vegetation will have to be grown back up. The corridor is still 150 feet wide. It's just it'll have a little bit taller vegetation, but it doesn't, it doesn't address the concerns. Great, thank you both. Uh, I'm seeing lots of questions in the Q&A box uh, about uh, if the, le the main legislature um, can do anything at this point uh, to intervene. Um, Sue, can you speak to that if, uh, if the main legislature has, has uh, any authority at this point and uh, what could possibly possibly be done uh, through the legislature? Sure, so it may be that when the legislature, we, you know, it's, it's adjourned, um, there was the potential of having some type of special session, but at, at this point, it seems unlikely. Um, so we aren't gonna have an opportunity to have our legislature reconvene until January. Um, so uh, it, it may be possible that there's a legislative fix come January, uh, but, the um, legislative action at this time would be a little premature. It's, it's just so hard to know what the com com composition of the legislature is gonna be. We have an election coming up. Um, you know, there's no opportunity for them to introduce legislation. So the focus for our efforts right now should be on the Army Corps of Engineers permitting process. I've put Jay Clement's email in the chat box um, and Todd will be sending an email follow-up um, that process is still ongoing. They are still completing an environmental impact statement. They have not issued a permit yet. And so the time is now and it is immediate um, for folks to reach out to the Army Corps and make it known this project is going to have a significant environmental impact on Maine's North Woods. It is highly unpopular in the state of Maine. People don't want it and that we want a full environmental, social, cultural, economic reckoning of the impact of this project. And the way to do that is for the Corps to do an environmental impact statement. They have not done that yet. They have only done an environmental assessment. So if we want them to do an, an environmental impact statement, we have to ask for it, and we have to ask for it in large, large numbers. So the, the immediate need is to have to flood Jay's inbox with requests for an environmental impact statement. That's the best thing. Um, and then the other thing to do is to encourage your state and federal representatives to do the same. So, you know, whoever's district you live in, um, ask them to ask the core. Um, if you live in Representative Golden's district, he's already made that request. Thank him for it. Um, it is no small thing right now for our legislators to turn their attention from COVID to this issue and so we want to be we, we want to respond and say thank you this was a great thing for you to ask um, so reach out to your legislators um, and ask them to reach out to the core those are two concrete things that you can do right now um, or you can do it when you get Todd's email tomorrow 
um, but it would make a huge difference. And that's where the fight is right now. And, and let me add that a federal environmental impact statement was done for the Vermont project. One was done for the Northern Pass project. Maine deserves nothing less. Yeah, and the key, the key is um, it's, a, it's a significant impact. That's the question, is whether or not there's a significant impact on Maine's environment. Um, and so just highlight the impacts that you are most concerned about in your request. And, and if I could add one other thing, uh, I, I would just, people should be talking to their representatives also about the public lands issues that are involved here. Because these lands were acquired for the benefit of the people of Maine. Um, the lands that they're crossing through were all designated in the planning process as their primary uses were fish and wildlife habitat and timber. Uh, you put a power line through the middle of it and it's no longer a good fish and wildlife habitat and it sure can't be managed for timber, timber production anymore. Um, and all of that was done not just with minimal public input, it was done with no public input. And that just should not happen with lands that are owned by the people of Maine. Great, thanks, Jeff. And I'm gonna pitch this next question to you as well, Jeff. Uh, there's a lot of questions coming in um, about the impacts uh, of, of Hydro-Quebec's dams uh, in Canada, uh, on, on Canada's and especially indigenous land. Um, Jeff, you spoke about the impacts that this corridor would have uh, on Maine's uh, you know, freshwater resources. Can you speak about the impact that, uh, that Hydro-Quebec dams have on, on lands uh, in Canada? Yeah, it, 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 is, it is just devastating. Uh, essentially, most of northern Quebec, most of the rivers in northern Quebec have been diverted from where they used to flow, from where God or Mother Nature, depending on your viewpoint, um, put them. Um, the water is diverted out of where it used to go. It's sent in a different direction, and that has just huge, they, they built enormous reservoirs. I mean, reservoirs that are many times the size of Moosehead Lake. Reservoirs that are huge compared to what we think of as big reservoirs in Maine, like Flagstaff Lake. Um, and uh, I, I think the most dramatic example I can think of is that the second highest waterfall in Canada is Churchill Falls. There is no longer any water falling over Churchill Falls any time except when there's a severe flood because all that water is diverted out of the Churchill River and sent someplace else to generate power with. And the impacts of that, I mean, it's, it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's, it's tundra and boreal forest. Um, and you know, millions of acres of it has been converted to reservoirs and all of the rivers have been diverted to, to other purposes. It's, it's just devastating for fish and wildlife. Um, there's some really powerful stuff on the internet um, from native peoples uh, who, who, who live in that territory about what the impacts have been for them on hunting, fishing, traditional travel corridors and things like that. But it's, it's a, we, we've had a lot of hydropower development in Maine. I spent half my career commenting on hydropower projects, and nothing we have in Maine comes close to the kinds of impacts of these enormous projects in, in Quebec. Great, thanks, Jeff. Um, Sue, I'm gonna pitch this next question to you. Um, it's a question about the impact that this, uh, the CMP corridor uh, would have on the, uh, the transmission grid and um, uh, blocking out you know, uh, Maine-based renewable energy from the grid. Um, can you speak to, to that concern? Sure. Um, so the question is, is really about what impact this project would have um, on new, new renewable projects. It's a 120 megawatt line. It's, it's a DC line. So um, it's, it's the line is fully subscribed. So even if you were able to tap into it, it wouldn't be possible to connect any of Maine's renewable energy projects along the way. The only way that would be possible is if there was less energy flowing on it and if it was an AC line. So in both those counts, um, CMP has excluded any um, renewable projects along the, the line from tapping into this, this transmission line. Um, but it also is, it's a, it's a big slug of energy. Um, and so it is going to cause congestion on our lines. Um, CMP has made some concessions in the permitting process to try to increase um, capacity. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's a bottleneck um, for Maine to get its renewable energy to markets in Massachusetts. Um, and this line only makes those congestion matters worse. So if in this time when we really wanna be growing Maine's renewable energy um, uh, economy here, we wanna be encouraging renewable energy projects here in the state, which provide jobs in the state. It provides 
clean energy in the state and it's verifiable, um, those projects are likely to suffer um, as a result of this project. Great, thank you, Sue. Uh, we have time just for a couple more questions. Uh, we're already over time, but we appreciate our panelists staying on just a little bit longer and appreciate all of you uh, staying on with us as well. Um, so Dave, I'm gonna pitch this next question to you. It's a, a question about how um, the CMP corridor would, would impact the Kennebec River specifically. Um, could you talk um, about uh, the um, burial underneath the Kennebec Gorge and any other impacts the line would have uh, directly on the Kennebec? <clears throat> Well, I, I can't speak to that from any great knowledge. Uh, I think I heard some concerns expect, you know, expressed about the uh, about the burial uh, affecting the hydrology of the river, but I, I haven't seen anything that leads me to believe that that's a serious concern. I can say um, it didn't come up a lot in our DEP process, um, but I have seen some of the documents related to the environmental assessment that's being done um, through the core process. Um, and there, there are some questions about, um, you know, they, they're, they're drilling under the, under the river. And so there is um, always at that point a risk of um, the drilling material spilling, um, but it hasn't been evaluated. It hasn't been investigated. Um, and then I, it didn't get a it didn't get a thorough vetting in the DEP process, um, but it it looks like it's getting a closer look now, and I, I don't know what the answer is going to be. Uh, I'll just add that with respect to fisheries, um, to be honest, the crossing over the main stem Kennebec didn't bother me much. As as a visitor to the region, it was going to have a huge visual impact, um, but the crossings on all of the tributaries do. You need to think about the fish population in these big rivers like the Kennebec as migratory. And they only spend part of the year in the Kennebec. Um, they're spending their winters all the way down in Wyman Lake and they're spending their fall uh, spawning in the tributaries like Cold Stream and Tom Hegan Stream and several other tributaries that are crossed by this. Moxie Stream, the crossing on Moxie Stream impacts brook trout spawning habitat. So the, the ecological impacts on all those small crossings on the tributaries um, far outweigh whatever benefits they gave us by getting rid of the crossing over the Kennebec. Great. Um, I'm getting some incredulous comments that there's got to be more that people can do than write the Army Corps. And you're right. Um, it's an urgent need to contact the Army Corps, which is why we're drumming this, this drum so, so repeatedly. Um, but there's always a need for letters to the editor. So I was remiss to not mention that one. But please reach out to either, you know, the, the big papers, the little papers, um, and write your concerns down. It's 250 words, it's very easy. Just let, the, let, let your neighbors know that you're concerned about this and that it's still very much a live issue. That's, that's another very important thing to do. Absolutely, thanks for adding that, Sue. Um, and uh, I'm gonna uh, end our program here. Uh, we're, we're 10 minutes over and I appreciate you all staying on late. Uh, just a couple comments before uh, we wrap up here. So. Um, again, thanks for joining us. Uh, you'll get an email from me tomorrow um, with a link to watch this uh, webinar. I encourage you to share it with your friends and family. Um, and you'll also, the, my email will also contain um, the action items uh, that we're asking folks to take, contacting the Army Corps, writing a letter to the editor, um, calling your state and federal lawmakers. Um, this fight is certainly not over. Um, it, the Northern Pass project went on for, the fight went on for eight years. Uh, and so, you know, we've been fighting this for a couple of years here in Maine. Um, and uh, the good folks here on this panel this evening have been in the trenches and will continue to be. Um, but we continue to need all of your support as well. So look for my email tomorrow, um, and I hope that you all have a good evening, and thanks for joining us tonight.